back then, we weren't real close. As far as my brothers and sisters, everybody kind of did their own thing. I had one sister and two brothers, and then a second family came along after the fact, and I had three more brothers. <laughs> so we had a, a fairly large family as far as that part goes, but my parents, when I was a little guy, bought a lot up on Lake Wisconsin and they built a cabin up there and that's where I, I did a lot of growing up as far as water skiing, fishing. Um, I mean, it was beautiful up there. I really liked it, but after the fact, my mom passed away there after they were retired and my dad couldn't stay there no more, so he moved to Baraboo, Wisconsin. Growing up, I went to a parochial school for eight years I went to Wilson Junior High for a year and then Auburn High School. After, after graduating from Auburn, I went to work at Amrock. The draft was really kicking off bad. The draft lottery, a live report on tonight's picking of the birth dates for the draft. Tonight, for the first time in uh, 27 years, the United All States right, has again sir. started a draft lottery. I, I dislike draft dodgers. I don't think they they belong here. I don't, you know, if they can't do what they got to do for their country, they don't need to be part of it. That's my opinion. And and the ones that went to Canada, they should have stayed there. I'm sorry, but that's my belief. This ain't a good thing. And so I kept thinking about it and I thought, well, I'm going to go where I can get the best training so that I might be able to come back. And so I went down and talked to the Marine Corps recruiter, and he asked me about my background in that, and I, all through Auburn, I had auto mechanics, and I had metals in that, so I knew how to weld and use a torch. And I worked on cars. I was actually racing cars on the weekends at Byron Drag Strip, and I did pretty fair. And he said, with your background, he says, I can guarantee you're gonna be in the motor pool. And so I signed papers and that. They sent me to Chicago. I took my physical. I came back. But then there was a waiting period because they had to have so many bodies to go in at one time. Okay, so I had like three weeks before they called me back and then gave me a date to, to be down there and that to catch the bus. So we got down there and we caught the bus. We went into Chicago and all the guys that enlisted were in one group and the draftees were in another group. And they still didn't have enough people for the Marine Corps. Okay, so they went, you, 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 and you just enlisted in the Marine Corps, get over there. And so we went to Chicago, you know, or from there on to the airplane and that to San Diego, California, where the bus picked us up and took us to MCRD, Marine Corps Recruit Depot. And of course you get off the bus, you got these footprints, you stand on them and that. Back when I went in, we called that the old Corps. The new Corps now is not the same. They can't beat you up or smack you or nothing like that like they did back then. I mean, they could get your attention and make you a believer real fast. So anyhow, we got our hair cut, shaved off. I didn't have much, I had a crew cut all my life because I, when I was in high school and I was in swimming and stuff, so I didn't have long hair. But anyways, we had the old type Quonson huts and that, which they got rid of and they got barracks now and stuff, but we had to kind of rough it more. We had a big concrete slab, slab with faucets. We'd hand wash our clothes out there I mean, everybody would be out there at the same time doing the same thing. We had one big drill instructor from a different platoon, and he came into our squad bay one night, or our Quonset huts, and he was drunk. And he was playing games with people and that. And we had a, I don't even remember his name, but, but a pretty good sized farm boy. And when you work on a farm back then, there was a lot of physical labor. And he kept messing with them, and he took them out the back of the squad bay. And pretty soon the farm boy came back, and the DI didn't. 
and the, the DI hit him and he beat the hell out of him, pardon my French. And probably, I'm going to say roughly three days later, there was three drill instructors that came in from a different platoon. And they took him out and they beat him up and put him in the hospital. And he didn't rejoin our platoon after that. I mean, when you lose time, then you gotta wait and, re and rejoin a different platoon when it comes along and that. And another, for instance, you know, it was all competition in boot camp too, as far as, you know, we had different things like the pugil stick training and stuff like that. It was all competition for penance on your guide on flag for your, for your platoon. And you wanted to be the top dog, so to speak. The drill instructors did. And they did this to us, I mean, as far as the competition part, you know, and to get you psyched up and one thing and another and that. They preached that to us all the way through boot camp. A lot of you guys won't be coming back. And it's, it's hard to have to think about something like that. So, but anyways, that, that was the whole deal going through there and that. So when graduation came, you know, everybody in the platoon graduated and went thing up. Okay, I was guaranteed the motor pool. My orders were to go to ITR, which is the Infantry Training Regiment for the Marine Corps. And different guys went different places, but everybody, and, and the ones that went different, got to go home for two weeks where we had to go to Camp Pendleton for this training for almost a month. Okay, and that's what we did. We went through the hills, we practiced, and one thing and another and that, I mean, it was one thing after another. And when we graduated at, from ITR, we got to come home for two weeks. And after the two weeks, we went back. I went to, I don't remember the small camp. Now they got, all these little camps inside of Camp Pendleton. Camp San Mateo, this one, that one, and the other one, there's a lot of them. So anyways, I reported to this one that I had orders for, which was an infantry unit. And I was with the first ones there, was a, a reactivated unit from World War II that had been deactivated and that. So that's a, it was forming up another one is what it amounted to. And so, as days went by, people kept checking in and checking in and that. And we got X amount of people. And I was actually the senior PFC in, in my area. And then they came and they was asking for volunteers for mortars. And so like a dummy, I raised my hand, I'll volunteer. And they, what they did is they brought back the 60 millimeter mortar, which was put away after World War II. They didn't use them no more. And so we got the mortars and that, and, and we, we went with the infantry and that as far as our training, because we already had that. But the mortars, you know, there was, there was one mortar to every platoon. And the, the mortars then, when we, when we switched there, we had special training in that for this gun. And we'd have to carry this thing in that, and uh, the mortar weighed 60 pounds. And carry something like that all day and see how you feel. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But anyways, we practiced with this thing and one thing and another and that, so then we get our orders. Everybody takes their sea bags out and they're loaded on a truck. We get on buses. We go back to San Diego. We board ships. Our whole battalion. And I was fortunate. I got an air on an aircraft carrier with helicopters, and we had, you know, some. Jeeps, we'd call them Jeeps, they were mighty mites and that, and some howitzer cannons and shit like that. And part of my country. But all of this stuff anyway, and then we, we set sail, okay? And this aircraft carrier was from World War II. He had the old planks for the, the deck on top and that. And we trained on this on the hangar deck and stuff on the way. And 
we got to Okinawa and we had to unload from this carrier and reload onto the USS Iwo Jima, which was a newer carrier. And the Valley Forge we was on went back to the States and they put it in mothballs. <laughs> Did I tell you anything? <laughs> but anyways, we started out again. Okay, and then we got in a typhoon. And if you looked out the portholes and that, the troop transports would go through a wave and you couldn't see them. And then pretty soon they'd come out on the other side. And I'd never seen nothing like that. But the carrier is like 15 stories above the water. And we actually had water coming over the flight deck. And I don't think they had enough soda crackers for everybody. I mean, we had a lot of sick sailors and Marines and that. But anyways, then we went to the Philippines and we spent two weeks in the Philippines for guerrilla warfare training. Because of the humidity and stuff, trying to get us conditioned for where we was going. So we left there and we got to Vietnam and we sat off the coast and they got a call and so they had choppers on the flight deck warming up and so many of us had to board these things and in the meantime I mean we're loading ammunition that which we didn't have down below and that they had all that locked up but I mean we got all kinds of stuff up there and that was loading magazines and stuff and we had to go in on these choppers and hit the VC from behind because these guys were pinned down. It was from some army guys or whatever. We don't know who the outfit was or anything, but we hit them from behind and that and broke it up where they they disappeared. And a lot of times they'll drag bodies off and that, so you don't even know how many people that you shot or anything. They'd cover up whatever they could and that. But anyways, then the choppers would come back when it was over and that and pick us up and take us back to the, the ship. And then we'd have to clean our equipment and that and you know, kind of go back to having classes and that until something else happened. We did fly two support missions off the ship. And then something happened that I couldn't relate to as far as our day and time back in 65, 66. Because it was 66 when we went into Vietnam. And when it came that time, they had these landing craft that came up to the carrier and that, and we had to go down the side of the ship on these nets. And I thought that was something that was long gone as far as what we've got today, even back then. So we did, and we circled, and we circled and that. And they told us before that when we hit the beach, they wanted to see, I probably shouldn't say that, they, didn't, they wanted to see nothing but ourselves and elbows. When you hit the beach, you start digging in. Because supposedly, supposedly they told us that the second battalion, 26 Marines, when they landed, they never took a fire around on Adam or nothing. They just kind of laid around in that, and they got hit by mortars and stuff that night and tore them up pretty bad. And so that makes you think too in that. And we come off these, that gate goes down, we just going like hell trying to get in there someplace and that, and we was digging, making holes and stuff, and we never took them around. And so the next morning, we started humping, and they, they called it Operation Chinook One back then. And so we was actually a, a search and destroy operation there at that point. We was going, and it was actually South Vietnam we was in at the time. So we moved in and that, and we found a few VC here and there. And most of the villages didn't have any kind of sign of anything. And there was one village that had ammunition and guns and an excessive amount of rice, and there was nobody there. And so the village was destroyed. All the ammunition was blown up and so on and so forth and that. So that they couldn't come back and get it. And when that was over and that, then we went to an area and we 
built some sandbag bunkers and stuff and that for protection and stuff. And then we started getting some mortar rounds and one thing and another and that, so we had to really dig in. And we got hit one night by the Viet Cong, the hardcore. And supposedly they estimated like a regiment and we were a battalion. We were actually a whole regiment, but it was here and there and that, you know, so. And we actually ran out of ammunition before daylight. And that was a scary time. But the next day we started over pretty much and that we had casualties and that that they loaded on choppers and took out to the hospital ship and that. So pretty soon we got orders to start moving again. This time they called it Operation Chinook Do, which <laughs> we didn't know what day it was or where we were at or nothing. But anyways, we started out and we started going doing the same thing. It was a search and destroy operation. Our outfit was actually based at Phu Bai, Vietnam. And my platoon was on a hill at Dong Ha, Vietnam. There's a little Vietnamese village out there on the side, and that was Dong Ha. And then people go one way or another, but Dong Ha was actually in North Vietnam. And so almost every night we'd set out an ambush. And we had all this information from other ones that were there and that, you know. And so when you go out, it's daylight, and so you set up this am <laughs> you set up this ambush site. So you got a trail, and you're so many yards or whatever back off the trail. But that way you can see if anybody comes down the trail, and you can actually radio back for illumination rounds because they've got you pinpointed as far as where your location is. But the thing about it, when it got dark. You moved because anybody can see you where you're at in the daytime so they know where you're at okay then you move after dark you move your ambush site and that way catch them off guard and that does work We was actually out there during the monsoon, and it rained day and night. And you'd be in a sandbag bunker, and you didn't have nothing dry to put on. And it'd get down to 60 degrees at night, and you're soaking wet. And you're cold. And it was like that for over a month. And if you took your boots off to try and hang them up inside your bunker to get them dry because these sandbag bunkers we had sandbags on top and that you know to keep the mortars from coming on down on us and that take your socks off and part of your feet come with them because they're rotten and I got bad feet but there's nothing you could do you was there you had to make the best of it. I actually at one point got a visit from the commanding officer of my outfit telling me that I had to write home to my mother. We didn't have time to write letters. And I wrote a letter and, and put it in the mail, and that's when I had to drive this Jeep that night, or that afternoon, because I was back there. But he kept us going in that, and between that and the water and stuff, you know, we didn't have any way to write letters.
There was one other time that we, the company had a platoon for an operation on a, on a hill set up there in that. And that was in the north part too in that. So, but anyways, you know, they'd use up ammunition and stuff and food and that. So this captain, and, and even then you had to have a military driver's license to check out a, a Jeep or anything. But anyways, we was back there and he came and, and got me, because I had a license. I had to draw a Mighty Might, which is a small Jeep and a trailer. And the company driver was there. Okay, so I drew the ammunition, he drew the SIG rations. And the captain waited until evening time. And we drove along the highway, along the ocean, to resupply the platoon on the hill. And so we unloaded, and instead of taking off right away, he's whatever in that, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. It's getting dark. So we drive part way back, and we pull off the highway. Okay, now you talk about scared. Four people. We pull back there, and there's this Vietnamese cemetery. Okay, so we got the mighty might and the traitors back there. Now he takes my rifle. The company gunnery sergeant had a rifle. The company driver had a rifle. I had one. But the three of them, the captain went out there and they set up an ambush. Three people. And I had to stay with the vehicles. And I, you're not supposed to do that, but when I was in Oceanside, I bought a 45. And I had that with me under my fiberglass vest. I had a shoulder holster, I carried that thing in. And I also had a pouch that had nine frag grenades in it. So I had that back there and that, but when it got dark, darker, I moved from there and I got inside of one of these. They're above ground and they look like a boat. And there's a Vietnamese person that's buried in there. And so I moved and I got inside of one of them. So that I was kind of hid as far as if something happened. You talk about scared that night, I'll tell you what, it's a good thing you have a good heart when you're young. So, but anyway, the next morning came and they came back, nothing happened, and we went back to Dong Ha. And, I mean, it's crazy. Crazy things happened, and like I said, this captain was not right. I don't think he had a full deck up above, but he had to follow orders within reason. I would never have asked any of my people to do what I wouldn't do with them. That wouldn't happen. I was brainwashed to a certain point, but you got to stop someplace. You know, if you, you'd catch a VC Viet Cong, which would be a guerrilla for the North Vietnam, the Arvins would uh, question them, interpret them, or whatever the case may be. And in order to get answers out of them, they did whatever they wanted to to them. I mean, they'd take a knife and whatever, trying to get them to talk. And when it was all said and done, they'd kill them. They actually threw bodies out of a chopper trying to question them and that. And guys are alive. Throw them out. I mean, all kinds of crazy things happened over there. And like I said, part of them was South Vietnamese doing it. So, but like I said, I mean, it was trying to get information. I don't know if it was what you consider the right way to do it. It was against the Geneva Convention. But we had to go against the Geneva Convention, and they didn't. We, we couldn't sharpen a bayonet, 
okay, but they could. Um, we used shotguns over there, and we had double lot buck. Now these were brass cartridges for the military, but we actually had some that looked like fish hooks that were straightened out. And how many of them were in 12 gauge shell, I don't know. And they took all them away because it was against the Geneva Convention. You shoot somebody with that and it goes into the bones and everything. I mean, it's just like a harpoon, a bunch of them. What'd they make them for? But it's against the Geneva Convention, you can't do it. And you can't torture these people. Over there, we found one guy, evidently it was from the army. And when we went on a in North Vietnam search and destroy there, hanging upside down from a tree. Naked as a jaybird, cut all the hell. But you can't do it. I mean, they tortured the heck out of the guy. But don't you do it. And that leaves a very bitter taste in your mouth when you see something like that. That hurts. So, I mean, it makes you hard. Probably very hard, and it makes you want to get even, so to speak. And I was somewhat, at that point, when I was trying to go back to my outfit, I figured I had scores to settle in. I wasn't ready to come home. And when they sent me here, and I got back, and I started thinking about how lucky I was, then I didn't want to go back. In 66, they actually went so far as to try and tell us, and like I said, we're actually in North Vietnam, but when we were going to go there, leave there to go out, we couldn't lock and load our rifle unless somebody shot at us. Are you serious? I don't think so. By the time you do that, you could be dead. I mean, you lock and load your rifle, and you got to be ready, because you may not get a second chance. But whoever came up with that, I mean, it was unreal. I never heard such a stupid thing in my life. I mean, this is a combat zone. And we got a couple of replacements over there, those black guys, and they came and they're bouncing around wearing sunglasses and stuff. We didn't have sunglasses. We didn't have nothing. And we was getting ready to go out on a mission. And, okay, you guys go with Wyatt you go to the ammo bunker there and you draw X amount of HE rounds for the 60 millimeter mortar for your pack board. And it usually be about eight rounds. And that's not light. You know, they're so big around and like this. So, and they started, you know, giving me a ration. And Wyatt stepped in and that and he says, hey, he says, I don't want to hear any of that crap over here about black, white, or anything else. He says, he says, this guy will not ask you to do anything that he won't do right alongside of you. And he says, I'll back him up 100%. And he says, now get your butts out of here and go and do what he told you to do. We got hit one night there and that, and I actually had a piece of shrapnel in my face and one on my leg, and that was nothing really. That was, you know, people were getting hurt, and I was functional, so, you know, I never even, never even, you know, got a, got a purple heart for that or anything. But, and, and then the night I got that, when I got that shrapnel on that, I actually got picked up and and thrown from my my uh, mortar bunker, probably 50 yards and you can't hear for a while. You don't know if you're coming or going or where you're at. But that was all part of the game, I guess, back then. And it got to be a certain point. 
and I wasn't feeling good in that. I talked to the corpsman, and so they had a a tent in that for a hospital there at Dong Ha, and so they sent me there in that, and they started checking me out, and my blood was all messed up. I had, I can't even tell you this anymore, one, the red blood cell was eating the white one or something, something like that. I was very, very messed up on my blood. And so they took me from there out to the USS Repose, which was a hospital ship, and started giving me stuff to try and straighten my blood out and that. At that point, I was actually supposed to be going on R&R, your 13 months tour over there. And I had almost 12, I had 11 and a half months over there. So I was actually a short timer and I was going to go to R&R to Bangkok. And then I'd have to come back and I probably wouldn't rejoin my outfit then in that because I wouldn't have enough time left. And so they'd probably end up shipping me back to the States. Now, they didn't let me go on R&R. They sent me back to the States because my, my blood wasn't straightened out yet. And I was in the hospital in Yokosuka, Japan. From there, they sent me to the hospital in Philadelphia, Naval Hospital. And from there, I went two weeks back home and then back to Camp Pendleton. When I when I got into Chicago, I caught a bus to Rockford and that, but there was, there was nobody, I mean, but nobody to greet you. They was down on people that was over there. And when you was wearing a uniform, you had your ribbons on there and that, so they, they knew where you was coming from and that. They wouldn't have nothing to do with you. You know, there was no no friendly people towards us. And I understand some of them were called baby killers and everything else, but I mean, I never seen anything like that. It was a, a, a nasty and a very bad experience. And when I got out and I came home, I couldn't sleep. I mean, for weeks, I couldn't sleep. If anybody moved in the house, I was up. I was going. I mean, it's just the way you are. Your hair goes up in the back of your neck. I don't know if you call it scared or instinct, I guess. It was, I want to say it was close to the 4th of July and that because people were shooting fireworks. And I like to have a heart attack. I mean, a firecracker goes off and you're digging a hole. I mean, you're on you're on the ground. It's uh, and and even today, you know, if I don't know something like that's happening, you know, it scared the hell out of you. Even now, even at my age, I mean, it makes your heart flutter. It's something that you don't get used to, I don't think. I, I'm still very fidgety at times. It was very hard. When I got out and I came back, because I'd taken a leave of absence, I went back to work in Amrock and that. And it can be a noisy place. And I had I had a rough time trying to get used to it. I mean, it was like night and day difference from, you know, what I was into.
First of all, I want to thank Mr. Stangy and Miss Noonan for allowing me to be a part of such an amazing class. I have learned a lot in this class, such as computer editing, learning about my grandfather's stories during the Vietnam War that I haven't heard before, and other interesting things. I would also like to thank my grandfather for letting me have the honor to make a documentary on him and his experiences in the Vietnam War. My grandfather has told me some experiences in Vietnam before, but never this in depth. His story has shown what true bravery, courage, and sacrifice means to the U.S. and its people. When I first heard of Har the Harlem Veterans Project in 10th grade, I was thinking I was not going to sign up for the class for 11th grade. 11th grade came and I felt that before I missed the opportunity to make a documentary on my grandfather and have his story told, I knew I needed to join the Harlem Veterans Project. So I signed up for the class in 12th, for 12th grade. I am so glad that I did. I will always remember my experience in this class. Again, I would like to thank Mr. Stingy and Miss Noonan, and a special thank you to my grandfather. Thank you for your service, sir.